Hello, my name is Nancy. Hello, my name is Rowan. Welcome to our show, Hands on Health. This show has been sponsored by Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services, DHHS. And the reason for this program is for us to educate our deaf community so that you can make good decisions for your health. Today, we're going to talk about HIV and AIDS. We have a special guest, and this is Tracy Melanoski Foner. Tracy. Hello. Thanks for having me. So can you tell us what you do and what your role is for Kent County Health Department? Absolutely. So I am a public health educator at the Kent County Health Department and I've been at the health department for almost 18 years now. Wonderful. So let's just start with some basic information. We have two words we're talking about today, HIV and AIDS. And so if you could expand on those and tell us what each of those mean and how they're different. Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So HIV stands for Human Immunodeficiency Virus. And AIDS stands for Acquired Immune Deficiency Syndrome. And so HIV is the virus that affects a person's immune system. And the AIDS term um, is more of a kind of a stage of HIV infection or a diagnosis. So AIDS is when the immune system is really affected by this virus that got in, affected your immune system, and it's classified as having a person having AIDS when their CD4 cell count, which is a big immune system player, when that gets below 200, or they have something called an opportunistic infection. An opportunistic infection is infections that people who have HIV are more likely to get. When we look at HIV and AIDS, how do we get the virus? What causes it? Is it through sex or through things that are shared, whether it be food or something else? How do we contract it? Great question. So there are, I, I like to look at it as far as there's fluids that can get infected with HIV. So the fluids that, if somebody has it, it can be found in semen, so stuff that's coming out of the penis, vaginal fluid, fluid that's coming out of the vagina, um, blood, and breast milk. So again, you just don't develop it within those fluids. You have to get it from another person, and then those are found in those specific fluids. So there is you know, information out there, misinformation, that um, has been around for a lot of years, and that information um, was those things. Like you can get it from eating off of a spoon of somebody else's. You could get it from using somebody's towels. That's all misinformation that's out there, so it's really um, those specific flu fluids that we're talking about that get into another person's body that have the virus in it. Nancy, I see. Hmm. So suppose I have HIV, um, or, I, excuse me, interpreter correction, I don't have HIV. How can I protect myself from contracting HIV? 
Sure, sure, great question. So since we know they're in those four fluids, if somebody does not have HIV and they're, they're hoping to keep it that way, some great things that um, are helpful is during sex, um, using a condom. So we're latex condom, um, polyurethane condom. Um, if you are sexually active with somebody, it would be recommended that you get a test and that you have your partner get a test to, to know your status. Um, if we're talking other things, like if somebody injects needles, injects drugs um, by needles, that they make sure that they're not sharing with other people. Um, and then I always recommend just having communication with your partners and really understanding have you been tested? Has your partner been tested for sexually transmitted infections as a way to help reduce your chances of getting an infection? I remember and looking back, it's been some time now where it happened that a patient needed a blood transfusion. And at that time is when we became aware of HIV. Now we have special testing. Uh, say, for example, if someone wants to donate blood, do they test that blood before it's given to a patient? Good question, yes. Yeah, so all the blood does go through testing. Um, so if there is somebody that um, is concerned about, I have to have this blood transfusion, what am I going to get other infections? So they do have to test it and they would not use that blood if it had HIV in it. So yeah, so there was, um, you know, back in the 1980s when we first heard about this, right, it was a very different story. We know so much more, there's so much more research, um, and we, we just, you know, have processes in place that makes it safer for everybody. Good. My question kind of relates to that. Um, before, if you had contracted HIV, um, you would soon pass away from AIDS. Um, but is that still true today? Yeah. So we have come a long way. So in the 1980s, we really, I mean, there were a lot of people passing away from something that they didn't really understand. But now that there's so much research and understanding um, in the medical community, a person that has HIV finds out they have, are diagnosed with it, they can get on medication and they can live a long, normal, healthy life. So it wasn't that way, you know, many, many years ago. But now if somebody finds out that they have it, um, they can definitely live like anybody else that doesn't have HIV. Oh, okay. All right, so... Uh, if we get a report that indicates we do indeed have HIV, what's the next step? Do you have a program where you provide education on different issues and the types of medications that one would use, whether it would be oral or by injection? Do you have a program that lays out all those different issues? Yeah, so we, there's a lot of resources in Kent County. Um, if you were to go to the Kent County Health Department where I work and go to our personal health services, which is where we do our STI and HIV testing, as well as some hepatitis testing, if you came back finding out that you did in fact have HIV, we have counselors there. Um, we have nurses that refer you to different programs that will provide treatment in counseling and really make sure you're, you're getting the, the information and the resources and the medication that you you need to get your immune system um, healthy again and live that you know healthy productive life that you're wanting so there's a, a lot in our community and then just there is also um, Ryan White funding um, that is available to anybody in Michigan and it is just to make sure that that person who is then diagnosed with HIV that they have those resources and it doesn't cost that any any um, any money at all so Wonderful. So those resources, um, give me another example of what those resources might look like and also what kind of medication is available for managing 
HIV. Maybe give me an um, example of, of some of those that are used to, health, uh, to help those who are, are going through having HIV. Sure, sure. So I'm not a medical doctor, but um, I, so there's a lot of different ones in our community um, that would provide treatment. So it'd be really up to the doctor and the patient to figure out what's best for that individual. Um, and, but I'd like to clear up misinformation. Historically, there was so much medication that a person with HIV needed to take. It was a lot of, lot of pills. It is not that way anymore. So we're not, you're not taking 20 pills. You might be taking one or two, depending on what your situation is. So, um, so I'm not gonna speak to the specific medications, but your provider um, can definitely set that up with you um, and, and give you the information to, to make sure it's working for what your lifestyle is. HIV and AIDS. So Tracy, can you explain the difference between the two? What's the distinction? Mm -hmm. How can you explain the difference between the two? Sure, so HIV is the virus that goes into a person's system and really torments the immune system. So it tries to take over the immune system. Where AIDS is more of like a separate stage of HIV. So if somebody was newly infected with HIV, um, they wouldn't then have AIDS. When it's defined as having AIDS, that means that your immune system is really compromised and it's really taken a toll on your immune system. And how they classify AIDS is that you have these CD4 cells in your body and it really kind of helps to support your immune system. If those CD4 cells get below 200, which is pretty low, or you have an opportunistic infection, which is infections that typically people who have HIV would have, then you would be diagnosed with AIDS or you would be in that stage of AIDS. So it's just more of a stage than anything rather than a separate infection. So HIV is the virus, but AIDS is more of the stage of the HIV virus and what it's doing to the immune system. I see, sure. So now what about, um, we've heard as far as with COVID, there are variants. <laughs> HIV, uh, probably not, right? You said there was one um, that we see here in, in Michigan. So how, um, let's talk about how HIV affects the body and the symptoms that show up with HIV. Sure, sure. So it's possible for somebody to have HIV and not have any symptoms at all, or they could be very slight. And sometimes they're flu-like symptoms, um, muscle aches, um, you have a fever. So those typical flu-like symptoms, um, sometimes it's so slight that you're like, eh, I'm just kind of tired, right? And if you're not getting tested, you truly don't know. Um, if somebody has an HIV infection and they go years without getting tested to understand whether or not they have this, then we can see more symptoms, more severe symptoms. And it's really affecting your immune system, those normal colds, flu, those things that you should be able to fight, it's harder to fight because your immune system's not working properly. So just kind of depends on how we're, you know, what we're talking about as far as if somebody is newly infected, they may or may not have symptoms um, that they recognize if they have, um, if they've had it for a long period of time, we would see more um, severe symptoms of HIV, you know, taking a toll on their immune system. So when you talk about blood transfusions or blood draws, mm -hmm. how often are you tested for HIV? Uh, is it quite often? Or can we self test or do we need to make an appointment with the doctor? How do we do that? And also I wanna uh, add to that about the T cell count. Um, where can we get that test or how do we do that test as well? Mm -hmm. So if you can discuss that. Sure, sure. So if you went to the health department, say you made an appointment, you wanted to get an HIV test, so you can set up an appointment. Um, there are some walk-in hours, um, but usually it's better to do an appointment. Um, and it is just a finger poke. 
you're poking your finger and it's a 20 minute test and it's a quick test is kind of what they call it. And you'll you get results in about 20 minutes. And there are people that are trained there um, that if it did come back positive, indicating that you have HIV in your body, they still have to run it through two more tests um, just to make sure that that information is accurate. And then they would refer you to an agency that can get you on treatment right away. They actually have people that will take you there if need be. Um, so you can make sure to get on treatment as soon as possible so you can get your body healthy again. Um, so then those extra, uh, extra tests would be looking at more of those details of the CD4 count or the T cell count that you're referencing. So yeah, so you can go to the health department for tests. Um, you can get it from your own provider. You can go to your healthcare provider and say that I wanna get an HIV test because um, it's not an automatic thing all the time, even though you know maybe we should be getting asked those questions that might indicate, oh, you know, we might have some risk and maybe we should be getting tested. Um, so. Our recommendation is if you are sexually active or if you are sharing needles, that you would be getting a test every three months. So, um, but not everybody will do that, but we would recommend it, you know, based on what's going on in your life. If you feel like there's a potential risk to get tested, just to know your status and get treatment as soon as possible. Wow, that's good to know. Possibly maybe two or three years ago, there was a new medication that came out. It was called PrEP, and it was for people without HIV, um, but it would help prevent them from getting HIV. And I know that there was a lot of talk at that time, a lot of information about it, but then I feel like uh, that talk has ended. And so I'm just wondering if the, that medication is still around and still used and still available. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. I wanted to bring it up in case, just in case it didn't come up. Um, so PrEP is, stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis. And it's a medication that a person can take and that person does not have HIV, but it's a medication that if by chance HIV were to come in their body, whichever way, semen, vaginal fluid, blood, or breast milk, we were lo really looking at those top three, it'd be less likely to stick in their body. So if somebody had unprotected sex or they weren't choosing to use a condom, they could take this medication on a daily basis and they'd be less likely to get HIV. And it's actually super effective around sexual transmission. So, you know, up to nine, high 90%, so really effective. So 99% truly, so yeah. And the wonderful thing is that we actually have a PrEP clinic at the health department. So we have a physician assistant that can set up a person with PrEP medication and you could get, use that on a regular basis and be less likely to get HIV. Fascinating. Huh. Hmm. I'd like to direct our attention now to AIDS. Uh, is there a lot of preparation for pa patients and their comfort when they're going through any pain and through uh, dying? Is there hospice provided, family support? Do you have a specific program that provides those supports? So at the health department, we don't necessarily, um, since we, we refer elsewhere to different agencies, in Kent County, um, so I would have to check in with them, but I would hope that um, there is a system in place. I can find out more information and definitely get that to you. Um, but again, as far as Ryan White funds, you know, we, we know that it's for the healthcare of somebody that has HIV or even is in, at the stage of AIDS. So that is a, a thing that's throughout the Michigan community that, um, that we can, definitely um, refer you elsewhere to find out more information on. We had already talked about how HIV affects the immune system and how it impacts someone's ability or response to vaccines or viruses and all that kind of thing. 
So should a person with HIV avoid getting vaccinated or should they get vaccinated against other viruses like the flu and COVID? Sure, great question and so much about what we're, we're talking about currently. Um, so if somebody it does have HIV, we would still absolutely recommend that they get COVID vaccinations, flu vaccinations. Um, we really recommend that for those who are immune compromised overall. Um, so it's really, it would be highly recommended. If you have something else going on, another health condition um, that you're kind of not sure about, I would recommend that you talk to your healthcare provider and just touch base with them to make sure that um, those other health conditions wouldn't be impacted by vaccines. But overall, it would be highly recommended for somebody who has HIV. I would like to add as well, when we look at the vaccines, what age should we consider for vaccines for HIV? So as far as vaccinations for HIV? Okay, so there are That's correct. Okay, so there are no vaccines for like preventing HIV. There's only vaccines for COVID, for example, for flu. Um, there is medication to um, treat HIV, but there is not a cure at this point or a vaccine that would, um, would cure it, for example. There's medication to treat it, yep. I hope that I see it at some point in my day um, that we have a cure for it. I was wondering about I, that. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I was so wondering. Too. Yes. Mm -hmm. So suppose I were to find out that I had HIV and my budget may be limited, finances are tight, uh, maybe my insurance is not great, and I need care. So are there options for resources here in our area that we can take advantage of? There That's are. a good question. Yeah. And there are, yeah. So um, we, you know, we work with a lot of different um, community organizations. Since we aren't the ones to to continue care, we're doing testing, treatment, and then we refer to continued health care. Um, there are there are quite a few, um, and I mean. There's Red Project that we work with, there's Macaulay Health, there's various places that do have funds to help support that person if they cannot t take care of the medication, take care of other things that are impacted by HIV. So there are some great programs in our community that can assist that person. That's wonderful. And how do we find those programs uh, we just search on the internet or maybe go to the health department website or where can we find those resources? Sure, sure. Yeah, so the health department does have information on their website. Um, if you were to go in for testing at the health department, we do have a resource card and we have direct referrals. So if somebody was diagnosed with HIV, um, we, we can do a warm handoff and just make sure you're getting set up directly with those organizations to assist you. So, um, so we have both. So we have information that we can share with you all. Um, we have it on our website, but we also will talk directly with you at time of testing if we need to refer you to another agency. I have a female question for you now sure. and say this female has uh, or is pregnant and has HIV, can she get treatment and still have a natural birth versus cesarean or uh, yeah, what's the status on that? Sure, and it's changed throughout the years. So we're just learning more information and more research. So if there is a person that is pregnant and is HIV positive, we would recommend that that person be on medication um, during pregnancy, but also afterwards. And if, if they stay on it on a regular basis, there's only about a 1% chance that they would transfer HIV to that baby. So it's really great odds that they would not transfer HIV onto the baby if they're taking their medication. Yeah. And if I can add to that, um, 
So when a person takes medication, whether or not they're pregnant, um, they, if they take their medication on a regular basis, they can get to an undetectable level. Undetectable level of HIV means there's such a small, of H, small amount of HIV in the body that they can't even find it. Doesn't mean that they cured it, but there's such a small amount that if it's undetectable, they're very, very, very unlikely to transmit it to their partners. And they actually say um, undetectable, untransmissible. So that's, that's amazing and that's something we've seen in the last few years with the research there. So medication works. Okay, that's good to know. Another question would be about, uh, I have, I do not have HIV. I don't show any symptoms. May I go ahead and have sex? Or do I need to be tested in order to share that with my partner or spouse? Uh, how do we protect one another? Yeah, so we would definitely recommend that um, both people that are going to be sexually active get tested just to know what their status is. Um, so we would recommend that if that is not an option for that person, we would recommend that they use condoms um, to lower their risk of infection. And then like we stated before, PrEP is another option, which is that medication that a person can take on a daily basis to make it less likely for them to get HIV. So I'm just curious here in the U.S., our population, what is the percentage of the U.S. population that has HIV? Yeah, I want to grab this paper so I say it correctly. Um, so we were looking at some information and, you know, unfortunately, there's, I was trying to look for specific deaf community and there's just not a lot of information out there. So if we're looking at overall information, there's approximately 1.2 million people in the U.S. that have HIV. Unfortunately, there's about 13% of them who don't know it. And then I would also add, as far as Michigan information, there was a drop in HIV screening in Michigan in 2020, which I imagine we can, we can look at COVID as being, okay, people were on lockdown, there were less services. So the new diagnosis rate in Michigan in 2020 was 25% lower than expected. And it came out to be that it was due to low testing rates during 2020. And there's likely to be significant higher numbers of recent infections of people with that are unaware that they have HIV. So, so it's unfortunate, you know, but really our recommendation is, would be to get tested to know your status. And it doesn't mean that it's going to turn into AIDS. That person can live a long life with HIV um, and do those things that they, they truly want to do. Um, it, it's not like it was back, you know, 30, 40 years ago. That's good information to think about. Yes. Do you think you have any more questions, Nancy? No, I have no further questions. This has been wonderful. Thank you so much for watching our program today. And next time we will be discussing diabetes. Thank you so much for watching our program today. Thank you so much, Tracy, for educating us on HIV and AIDS. I do want to inform you that here at DHHS, Deaf and Hard of Hearing Services, we do partner with the Ryan White Foundation and that program that we had mentioned before, if you are deaf, hard of hearing, or deaf blind, and you need help managing your uh, HIV diagnosis, please contact us and through our advocacy program, we will make sure that we uh, get you the appropriate care that you need and help through the Wyan Wright Foundation. Yes, thank you and thank you for watching.